Hi all, this is Jan Almighty and welcome to this video. So in this video, once again, something different. So I ask you and you deliver. Uh, when I ask you to comment uh, who, who, which master you would like to see, uh, about which master you would like to hear the story about, yeah, most of you wrote uh, Bobby Fischer and this is something I expected. Also, I would like to put out now, right on the beginning of this video, uh, actually Robert James Fischer, also known as Bobby Fischer, is my favorite chess player of all time. So I'm really glad that I am now of course, I plan to make a story about Fisher, but this is just, uh, yeah. I'm, I'm really glad that all, you also like to see his story, and I'm really glad that I can make this story and share it with you guys. So yeah, but first and foremost, uh, I would like to uh, also uh, reply on a couple of things from the previous video. Uh, first, thank, thanks to all of you for your support, and uh, I'm really glad that you liked the, the game that I played against the Grandmaster. Of course, I will be showing you more games in the future. And also, I'm, I guess I'm glad you liked my hair from before. <laughs> I seriously doubt that I will be growing it back again. But uh, I, I guess never say never, you know, if there will be some challenge or there will be some bet or something, you never know. But it, it isn't a plan in my near future. So moving on from that, uh, let's get back to this game. As, as always, when I start the uh, chess, chess master story, I would like to make an introduction. But I guess, um, I mean, everybody knows about Bobby Fischer. He is probably one of the most famous chess players of all time, along with Garry Kasparov. Um, if you ask even people who don't play chess and like people who even know very little about chess, they will know about Bobby Fischer because Bobby Fischer is a guy who, who popularized chess in a, in an era where chess was clearly only a Soviet thing. So only the Soviets kind of played chess. I mean, of course there were players all around the world playing chess, but, uh, everybody knew it was a Soviet thing. So if you're a Russian, you probably play chess. Uh, if you're a Soviet, you probably play chess, and so on and so forth. But Bobby Fischer comes as this uh, young guy from America, uh, a guy with a unique character, a, a, new, a new unique behavior, and starts uh, starts talk, talking about the Soviets, uh, and yeah, kind of picking them apart, and in the end, uh, bring the glory to his name. And in the end, glory to the United States, becoming a world champion. So he was a world champion in 19, from 1972 to 1975. Uh, his match with Spassky is probably one of the most important chess matches in uh, the 20th century. Um, nothing short of extraordinary. Uh, the Fisher games in those in that match. Yeah, uh, I will definitely show that at one point in the story. But yeah, just wanted to talk to you about that. And also about a couple of achievements and about Bobby's life. So Bobby started playing chess as a young boy, six years old. First his sister uh, started playing and then how it is, they say in the Fisher family, she challenged him for a game. He lost, started crying, but nevertheless, Bobby's, um, uh, Bobby's behavior was and mentality was such as that, okay, maybe I lost but I will do anything to win the game. So his primary goal in every tournament, in every game that he played was to win. So just win and that is the most important thing. So against his sister, he played a couple of more games and he started winning. And then uh, he act she actually uh, stopped playing and now we come to the interesting part. Uh, actually, Bobby's mother was, uh, uh, be she became worried about Bobby since uh, Bobby continued to play chess and he played ch chess against himself. She even took him to a doctor at one point, like to examine him to see if something is wrong with the boy. Uh, but uh, actually the doctor encouraged, uh, encouraged Bobby to play chess even more, so the mother put uh, the ad in the newspaper asking for some kind of a chess coach or a sparring partner for Bobby to play with. And fortunately, um, there was a, and there was a, an answer to that ad where uh, Bobby was actually invited to a simultaneous exhibition in a Brooklyn chess club. Uh, unfortunately, he lost the game. Of course, I mean, nobody expected expected that uh, expected him to win at that point since he was only six years old and he played games against his sister and uh, against himself. So, um, but nevertheless, uh, that didn't uh, kill his hunger for chess and for knowledge. 
he decided to push on and pursue his chess career. And after that, uh, you got tournaments and tournaments, Bobby uh, raising his uh, level of play. Um, uh, one, a couple of notable things is, uh, so this game of the century that I'm going to show you happened when he was 13 years old. At 14, he beca became the youngest uh, U.S. Chess world, ch uh, ch U.S. chess champion. Uh, at the age of 15, he broke the record for becoming the youngest grandmaster ever. Okay, that record was uh, later broken again, but at that time it was a big deal. Everybody started writing about him as uh, as a 13 year old. He also won the U.S. Junior Junior Chess Championship with eight wins and one draw. So an amazing result. So everybody was talking about in America about Bobby Fischer about the chess prodigy. But up until this game, uh, he wasn't that known to the world and to the other side, so Europe and that part. And after this game, his name will be propelled to the skies and to the heavens of chess, so to speak. And yeah, everybody will hear about Bobby Fischer. And uh, that being said, I would like to uh, just uh, show you this game. Uh, sit back and enjoy. So knight to f3, knight to f6. So starting with the ready opening and we have c4. G6, so something that Bobby uh, always uh, tried to do. Fianchetto, the black, uh, black uh, dark square bishop, going castle and then strike in the center. We have bishop to g7, d4 castles, and bishop to f4. So from ready opening to the English opening, and now Bobby transposes, transposes into the Grunfeld defense. And here in this position we have queen to b3. And for those of you who don't know the Grunfeld defense or don't play it, I just want to quickly cover if c takes on d5, c, uh, knight takes on d5, knight takes on d5, and queen takes on d5, it is clear that uh, bishop can take a pawn on c7. But uh, after knight to c6, e3 for example, and bishop to f5, uh, you have rook to c8, follows with a tempo, covering the c file, striking in the center, black has more than enough compensation for the pawn, because the development is really fast and it's re looking really good for black. So Byron uh, decided not to go for this line, so uh, I failed to mention uh, here, Bobby Fischer is playing against um, Mr. Byrne, he was uh, an international master at that time, uh, a very famous uh, US uh, chess player. Um, so Bobby, 13 years old in this game, uh, this is something called uh, Rosenfeld Cup. Uh, so yeah, I'll also I will show you after the game the standings. Uh, the thing is, uh, I would like to mention also is that Bobby isn't a f it wasn't a favorite in this game, not so ever. I mean, he achieved a lot of good results up until now, but uh, only in the junior division, and he won some tournaments. But now he's playing uh, against a really good player that is uh, rated more than him and has more chess experience. So yeah, uh, Byron plays queen to b3, and now we have d takes c4. So as I've said previously, in uh, those Slav, for example, openings, you wait for the bishop to develop, then you take on c4 with tempo, and now queen developed on b3, now you also take with the tempo. Now Fischer plays c6, but uh, maybe more active would be knight to a6. Doesn't look like a natural move with the knight, also playing it on the edge of the board, but the idea is after e3 or e4, for example, to play c5 and counter in the center. So this is a bit more active move to play, but okay, c6 is also okay, a bit more defensive, but covering the d5 square. We have e4, white is uh, establishing his dominance in the center and clearly showing that uh, he wants to pick up more space and black needs to find a way to actually counter it. Knight from b to d7 and we have a rook to d1. Uh, knight to b6 with tempo and uh, queen can go to b3. I would play queen to b3, but Byron decided queen to c5. Okay, bishop to g4, developing the bishop and also pinning the knight. And now the first mistake made by Byron is bishop to g5. In this position, yeah, it seems like a pretty much an okay position, also for white and for black. White has a bit more space in the center, but nevertheless, it looks natural. But uh, Bobby, uh, a chess genius that he is, uh, finds uh, actually the best move for black uh, that uh, causes black to have an immediate advantage here in this position. And the move is knight to a4. So, yeah, 
as you can see um, Bobby sensed that something was wrong with the position that uh, white has too many weak points so he decides decided to uh, take advantage of that somehow and he did with knight to a4 so let me just quickly show you if knight takes on a4 we have this knight takes on e4 so taking the the pawn and also attacking the queen and the bishop at the same time now we have two options if you play queen to c1 you have queen to a5 which is giving a check and also attacking this bishop so if you uh, cover with the bishop you have queen to a4 and in the end black pick up the piece back and also he pick up this central pawn uh, in the end uh, the white king is still in the center and all the pieces became undeveloped uh, if uh, if he played knight to c3 then you have bishop takes on f3 and suddenly this piece isn't uh, divided enough times and uh, fisher can take the bishop and as you can see white position is just bad so instead of queen to c c5 you have also bishop to e7 and now queen to c7 moving the queen out of the way so not not capturing the queen right away rather queen to c7 first and here again two options move the queen or capture the capture the rook if uh, you capture the rook then you have knight to c5 bishop to c5 and now after a couple of moves you actually lose lose a piece so bishop plays to a3 now we have b5 knight to c3 and queen to a5 b4 is coming it's unstoppable and again also there is some rook to e8 ideas so essentially black is better here instead of taking the instead of taking the, the rook uh, another move could be a uh, queen to a3 but then just you have rook from f to e8 attacking this bishop and if the bishop even moves then you have this cover checks with the knight again a much better position for black so Byron decided not to take on a4 he played queen to a3 and now we have uh, knight takes on c3 and uh, he didn't uh, Byron didn't take with the queen because he wanted to stay leave the pressure on the e7 and also if he captures with the queen then knight takes on e4 comes with the tempo b takes on c3 but bobby captures on e4 nevertheless and now the question follows will you take on e7 and open up the e file Byron did so he captured on e7 and we have queen to b6 now once again we are in a position uh, to see is it good to capture on f8 so let's look at it quickly bishop takes on f8 bishop takes on f8 with a tempo attacking the queen we have queen to b3 now knight to c3 takes you cannot take the the knight because bishop to b4 just losing the queen so queen captures on b6 and now a, ta a takes on b6 and in this position uh, the, the rook is attacked and you have to move it somewhere for example rook to a1 but uh, now you have threats bishop to a3 and bishop to b2 the rook will be lost and if you play a rook to d2 then you have bishop to b4 threat so once again white's position is really bad so okay uh you shouldn't take on e, uh, f8 right away and instead of that uh Byron decided to play bishop to c4 in order to uh have space for the king for him to go castle so that at least the king is safe and okay in this position uh bobby took on c3 and yeah now the question is uh, once again uh, can you uh, can you capture on uh, c3 not really since uh, rook to e8 and uh, this this uh, this bishop will fall so um uh, instead of that byron decided to play bishop to c5 and probably in his mind uh, now he's looking good since uh, the queen has to move or something and uh, essentially his lo well, black is losing the knight even knight to b5 wouldn't look so good for the knight uh, for the black so yeah he was feeling pretty confident in this position so um, bobby first uh, gave a check on e8 and king has went to f1 and in this position yeah uh, as you can see in the title the title is the game of the century and uh, with the move knight a4 from before uh, also the move that followed in this position actually probably gave it the title uh, one of the main reasons why it got the title the game of the century if you want you can pause the video and try and find the move but okay for those of you who just want to see i will just play the move and then we will explore the many possibilities that can go from there 
bishop to e6 clearly sacrificing the queen but there is a whole lot of idea but i just want to really pause for a moment and let you experience this moment that bobby fisher had sacrificing the queen in such a position as this is just pure chess greatness i would say the thing is you're in the middle game uh, the position is not that clear i mean there are some p pieces that are attacked on the white side but still this is a very very difficult position for uh to analyze and to see all the moves and uh, fisher decided to to sacrifice the queen here but then again it wasn't all just just for sure uh, just for show there was something behind it so if bishop takes on e6 let's let's explore many variations queen to b5 check uh king doesn't want to go on e1 because queen to e2 is checkmate so instead of that king goes to g1 and now you have this uh, famous motif uh, in these kinds of positions called uh, a smothered mate where you s sacrifice a queen such as this rook has to take and now knight to e2 is checkmate so just also wanted to show you quickly that so taking on e6 isn't an option if queen takes on c3 you have queen takes on c5 and after d takes on c5 you take the queen back bishop takes and rook takes in this position in the end black is a pawn up and with a much better position so this is a clear win for black and even bobby fisher at that age uh, wouldn't have problems to to actually win this game without breaking a sweat so this is also not good and um, okay so now the question is uh, what can uh, actually white play uh, he decided to play bishop capture on b6 maybe it would be a bad move but uh, at least he can hope for some counterplay and now we see the magic bishop takes on c4 check and now king to g1 and uh, first uh, fisher doesn't want to take on rook on d1 right away first he wants to pick up the d4 pawn because everything is forced uh, knight to e2 check uh, king f1 knight d4 check King has to go to g1, knight e2, king f1, and now knight to c3 back, check. King has to go to g1, and now first a takes on b6, so decided to take the piece with the tempo because now the queen is attacked. And uh, if, for example, queen takes, rook takes, uh, now in this position uh, the, the material is kind of equal, not really, for sure is better, but positionally is just much better and 92 9 g3 threat is just unstoppable winning the rook on h1 so yeah it isn't a good idea to actually sacrifice the queen here so queen to b4 is played and rook to a4 guarding the bishop queen to b6 and now knight to d1 finally picking up that rook and here just material wise uh, you see that the white has a queen for two bishops and a rook so so uh, as i said material may be close to equal but positionally white is just destroyed so uh, uh white decided to play h3 in order to um, so byron um, master byron decided to play uh, h3 in order to get some breathing space for the king in order to activate this rook into the game rook takes on a2 but bobby decided to pick up as much material as possible because yeah that that's what wins the games king to h2 and knight to f2 moving the knight out of the way and also capturing another pawn rook to e1 and at this point it just suits bobby to capture and if uh, knight captures right away then we have a strike with bishop to e5 right away and first because of that first baron decided to check on d8 we have bishop to f8 and now takes the rook on e1 but nevertheless uh, the position is is not that great for white and now fisher plays the absolute best move in the position so a clear understanding of the position and um, chess in general bishop to d5 uh, staying in the defense of this rook pressuring the g2 square uh, defending this weak uh, f7 pawn so that there are no threats with jumping of the knight uh, the bishop is clearly defending it and after pushing the b5 you will also defend the c6 pawn so an absolute genius move knight to f3 and now is also the time to improve the position of the knight knight to e4 and queen to b8 so b5 first to defend the pawn and also this pawn can just be pushed and become a queen but okay we have h4 and h5 so stopping threats on this side knight to e5 
threat is to jump on d7, so king to g7, so that uh, Bobby doesn't look, lose a bishop, and now the threat is a uh, bishop to d6, attacking the, the queen, the knight, and also the, the king, and king goes to g1. Bishop to c5, and now after this move, um, Byron decided to play king f1, he didn't want to go back on h2, and now there is actually a forced checkmate in 5, so if you want to, you can try and find it. I'm just going to show it to you, it's all forced, and Bobby shows it, knight to g3 check, king to e1, bishop to b4 check. We have king to d1, bishop to b3 check, king to c1, knight to e2 check, king to b1, knight to c3 check, king to c1, and rook to c2 checkmate. So yeah, this is it um, actually for this game. It's a beautiful game and a beautiful ending in this uh, series of moves to checkmate. It only suits the name, the game of the century. So uh, first, what I, I would like to show you is uh, that position in the game. Uh, just uh, let me go back to it quickly. Uh, I actually have a picture of Fisher uh, playing in that position. So right before uh, playing the move bishop to e6, uh, let me just show you quickly. So this is a young Fisher. In this uh, position as you can see really nice posture so it's really concentrated uh, and yeah he found found it in the end bishop to e6 so this is first that i wanted to show you second um this was a great game by fisher but this is the final standing of standings of the roosevelt cup in the end you see fisher ended up in ninth place uh, Ryshevsky was first, uh, you have uh, Pavy, so Pavy was actually the guy who held the, that simultaneous match when Fisher was six years old, where he beat Fisher like in short amount of time. You have also Barn was in fifth place, so there were some notable names, uh, not the best of Fisher's tournaments, but nevertheless it managed to produce this great game. So okay. That is pretty much it, um, as I've uh, called it in the title and as I've repeated re repeated sometimes in this video, uh, this game was titled The Game of the Century by Hans Knoch, uh, a famous chess arbiter uh, at that time, uh, so many people were amazed by it. As I've said, uh, people were writing about Fischer um, uh, when he started winning uh, with such great results the junior championship some tournaments but after this game came to light all the magazines all not all the magazines but chess magazines uh, papers all around the world started writing about this game and about bobby fisher a new great great chess player to become so yeah this is the beginning of our story my story about bobby fisher uh, I'm really looking forward to the rest of the games. As I said, he's my favorite chess player and I would like to invite you for the ride. So that being said, uh, well, sorry for the long video, but that's how it is, uh, especially for this beautiful game. I just wanted to say, as I said, uh, thank you for watching this video and yeah, I will see you next time.